I'm going to give you a topic, and I'd like you to talk about it for one to two minutes. Before you talk, you have one minute to think about what you're going to say. You can make some notes if you wish. Here's a pencil and some paper for making notes. Thanks. Here's your topic on this task card. I'd like you to describe a city you have visited. Okay. Thank you. Now remember that you have one to two minutes for this. Don't worry if I stop you. I'll tell you when the time is up. Can you start speaking now, please? I don't have a lot of experience of visiting other cities. I live in Rome, which of course is a very big city. And when I go on vacation with my family, we prefer to get away from the city and go to the beach or visit the countryside. So, I'm going to talk about a very small city in the south of Italy called Lecce. It seems more like a town, really, but technically it's a city because it's the administrative capital of the region. I don't think it's well known outside Italy. I went there because two years ago my family had a beach holiday about 20 kilometers away. And we went into Lecce to go to restaurants there. I remember it well because we went there five or six times. When you drive through the outskirts, it really doesn't appear to be a very interesting place. I'm not saying it's unpleasant, but there are lots of very ordinary apartment blocks and a lot of traffic congestion. However, when you actually get to the center and find somewhere to park, it's very nice. There are several beautiful old churches and the historic center is surprisingly pleasant. Most of the shops seem quite old-fashioned. Some of them give the impression that nothing has changed since the 1950s. The whole place feels very relaxed and the local people are extremely friendly. You get the feeling that they're happy living there and are proud of their city. I liked it very much. Would you like to live there? Yes, I would. I think I'd be very happy there. Do you think you will visit Lecce again? I'd like to. Perhaps we'll have another summer holiday in that area sometime soon. <laughs> it sounds a nice place. Now, can I have the task card back, please? Thank you. We've been talking about towns and cities. I'd like to discuss with you one or two more general questions relating to this. Let's talk about living in cities and the countryside. Do you think life is better in the city or in the countryside? I suppose it depends on the person. In many ways, life is easier in the countryside. By that, I mean that there's more space, no crowds, and it's usually cheaper to live. On the other hand, it can be a lot less interesting. Most cultural activity goes on in cities. Personally, I wouldn't want to live outside a city, but I've lived in Rome all my life. I imagine that if I'd lived all my life in a small village, I probably wouldn't want to live in a city. In many countries, cities are growing fast. Why do you think this is? Um, I'm not sure. Perhaps it's because in some countries, the standard of living in the countryside is very low, and life for a lot of people is just about growing enough food to live. I guess many people in that situation A. get bored and B. hope to find a higher standard of living in the city. What problems can rapidly expanding cities have? Let me think. Um, well, when cities expand very rapidly, 
It's often without any control over how they develop. In other words, they become mega cities with huge shanty towns and no proper, oh, what's the word, infrastructure for millions of people. Unfortunately, a lot of people don't find the better life they were hoping for and can end up in an even worse situation. This is probably one of the biggest problems we face today. Mm. Some cities receive millions of visitors. What problems can this cause? Ah, well, this is an entirely different problem. And I know a lot more about this because I live in Rome. If you go into the historic center on a Saturday in the summer, it can seem that you're the only local inhabitant there. The problem is that cities with too many visitors can lose their original character. Although, of course, it's not a problem for people who own restaurants and shops in the historic center. To put it another way, tourism supports a lot of people financially. What can be done to ensure tourism doesn't cause too many problems? That's not an easy question to answer. If you limit tourist numbers, you also limit the benefits to the local economy. And how do you limit visitor numbers? You can't put a wall around the city. If the tourist board in my city tried harder to promote the less famous parts of the city, the visitors might spread out. There are some beautiful areas outside the center with some great historic monuments, but very few tourists go there because they're all in the most famous places in the center. Thank you very much. That's the end of the speaking test. I'm going to give you a topic and I'd like you to talk about it for one to two minutes. Before you talk, you have one minute to think about what you're going to say. You can make some notes if you wish. Here's a pencil and some paper for making notes. Thanks. Here's your topic on this task card. I'd like you to describe the job or career you have or hope to have in the future. OK, thank you. Now, remember that you have one to two minutes for this. Don't worry if I stop you. I'll tell you when the time is up. Can you start speaking now, please? Right, OK. I'm going to talk about my job as a waiter. It's not a very difficult job, of course, but it's more complicated than most people think. The customers are spending a lot of money and they expect to have a perfect evening. You have to... Uh, you have to be kind of an actor, playing the role of the perfect waiter. It can be hard to do that at the end of a long evening when you're tired, but I try my best. Most of the customers seem nice people. I enjoy meeting them and I want to do the best I can to help them have a good time when they come to the restaurant. So, why did I choose to become a waiter? Well, actually, I didn't really choose it. A couple of years ago, I had just finished college and didn't have a job. A friend of mine was working in the restaurant and somebody was off sick, so I went to help out for a few days. Then I just stayed. I started to like it. The basic pay is very low, but I earn quite a lot in tips, so in fact it's quite well paid. The best part is that I have a lot of fun with the other people who work there. We're all really good friends. The only part of the job I really don't like is the hours. I can never go out on a Friday or Saturday night because I'm always at work. However, I'm not going to do this job for the rest of my life. I've been applying for other jobs recently. What sort of jobs have you been applying for? My degree is in media studies and so I'd really like to work in the media in some form, 
So I've been applying to local radio stations and a local TV production company. They don't have any vacancies at the moment, but I keep reminding them who I am. I'm going to apply to some other companies related to the media as well. Good luck with that. Can I have the task card back, please? Thanks. We've been talking about jobs. I'd like to discuss with you one or two more general questions relating to this. Let's consider the balance between work and free time. Do you think that the balance between work and free time in your country is about right? Uh, I think it depends. For example, people who have government jobs mostly only work around 37, maybe 40 hours a week. However, in my country, a lot of people have their own small businesses. Really, a lot of people. And if you have a shop, for example, it can be difficult to decide to close. You don't know if another customer is just about to come through the door with a lot of money to spend. From what I've seen, people with their own shops regularly work extremely long hours, up to perhaps 14 hours a day, 7 days a week. The same can be true for other people who work for themselves. I see. And what problems can be caused by too much work, do you think? It's, uh, it can cause problems for family life, in my opinion. It's obviously not very good for children if they hardly ever see their parents. And from what I've seen, it can be very bad for relationships between married couples if they just work continuously and never have any fun together. I'm sure this is a common reason for divorces. What can people do if they feel they are expected to do too much work? Well, there's a law in my country which limits the working week to, uh, I think it's 48 hours per week, maybe even less. But bosses frequently take no notice of this, so it can be a problem. If somebody is asked to work more than this, they should speak to their boss and ask to be given less work. But, of course, this can be difficult. It's not always easy to make a complaint to your boss. From what I've seen, they tend to make employees feel guilty for complaining. Hmm. Now, let's consider workaholics. Why do you think some people work so much that they become workaholics? Workaholics? Obviously, it depends on the person, but in my experience, it's... Well, it's not really the money that makes them workaholics. I think it's just something in their personalities which doesn't allow them to... Mm, to stop thinking about work and switch off. For example, I have a friend who runs his own website. He works on it all the time. <laughs> I don't think he sleeps much. But he doesn't make a lot of money from it, just enough to live. And I don't think he would make less money if he worked on it less. He's become a perfectionist. Every part of the site has to be absolutely perfect. It's become a kind of obsession for him. I think he's happy, but he just doesn't really have any interests at all, apart from his work. I guess that's just how he likes to live his life. It's up to him. Thank you very much. That's the end of the speaking test. Okay, Amane, now you must start talking, please. 
Well, in relation to success, I have to say that I consider my education my, by far my most important success. Um, this is due to the fact that while I was in university, I did meet my husband and I am married, so that was before I finished my degree. Since then, even though I have started a family, I've managed to obtain a degree with an honours and um, subsequently was accepted on a postgraduate programme, which was actually quite difficult to get into. Um, I think the main people who contributed to my success must have been my immediate family. My parents were very supportive in all my decisions and also my spouse um, gave me all the support that I could possibly um, need from a from husband. Um, I have to say that the most important factor was my own self-determination, my self-discipline, time management, and also uncompromising goals that I set for myself. Little goals, but nonetheless goals that made me reach where I am now. It's very important, in my opinion, to feel successful um, in an area that you choose. In my case, it was education. Um, of course, this success has opened many doors for me and will, of course, open many more. Uh, for instance, I know that I will be financially independent. I know that I will have a sense of achievement uh, that is probably not comparable to much else. Thanks, Amane. Now I would like to ask you a few more questions related to the same topic. How important is goal setting in your life? This is extremely important. If you don't set goals, reachable, feasible goals, then you may as well just stop doing what you're doing. Um, if you don't set these goals, then um, you lose track of what you've been up to and what else needs to be done. This leads to really destructive disorganization. And um, at the end of the day, you probably will end up with without any enough time, sufficient time to reach what you set out to reach. Uh, that's why um, self-discipline in keeping within your time frame for these goals and working hard to reaching them really does make a difference. Oh, tell me, Amine, do you consider yourself a real success? Um, that's a difficult question to answer because I might not be the biggest success compared to other people, but for me personally, yes. My personal opinion of myself, with the circumstances that I had, I do consider myself quite a success. Because after all, I did manage to divide my time fairly between my studies and the pursuit of my education and my family. I don't think I compromised my family in order to reach my educational goals, so therefore, yes, I do consider myself a success. Okay, thanks. And uh, do you think having an organized program can lead to people's success? Well, I think it's of the utmost importance, actually. Um, I think that not having an organized program or schedule um, will almost certainly result in the shortage of time. It's um, specifically important um, for short-term goals as time is of the essence. Um, a schedule is also necessary for, for long-term goals because um, um, it's human nature to put things off till later or you know, uh, procrastinate, and you end up running out of time without even realizing it. So having a schedule will help you keep track of it. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. That is the end of the speaking test. Thank you very much.
part two. Describe your perfect holiday. You should say where you would go and who you would go with, where you would stay, what you would do, and explain why it would be the perfect holiday. Well, my perfect holiday, hmm, let me see. There's really only one place it could be, and that's Iceland. I've always wanted to go there ever since I saw a documentary about it on TV when I was a young kid. The landscape looks amazing. My dream visit would take place in April, just when it's getting warm enough for the lowland snow to melt and the animals and plants to start to come to life again after the winter. I'd take my best friend Anna with me. We're both nature lovers, you see, and like the same things, so wouldn't really fight about what to do and where to go. I wouldn't like to stay in one place though, so definitely not a hotel. Besides, I couldn't afford one anyway. We'd probably stay in youth hostels or something, a different one each night as we would explore the island. As for what we'd do, that's easy. We'd go hiking in the countryside to see all the spectacular features of the island up close. The volcanoes, the lava rock, the geysers, the glaciers, you know. And it would be the best holiday ever for the simple reason that I would be with my favorite company in my favorite place the Icelandic wilderness, and it doesn't get any better than sharing your love of nature with your best friend. Not to mention the fact that I would be living out a childhood dream. Part 3 Do you prefer active holidays or holidays where you get to relax? It's active holidays for me every time. I like to get out and about and explore the places I visit and really get to know them. I'll never understand people who sit by the pool sunbathing for the whole week. I mean, they never get to experience anything. If I had my way, I'd be hiking in the mountains or doing a city walking tour, anything interesting like that, rather than being stuck in my hotel for seven days, boring. Are there any countries you would not like to visit? A few I can think of. Iran, maybe, because it's unsafe, or so I've heard. And that's such a shame, as it's supposed to be a beautiful country, full of, for the most part, friendly little village communities. Singapore as well, because it's too hot and humid there. I would die of heat exhaustion. Anywhere else? Hmm, yes. Well, I'm not sure about South Korea and China either. I don't think the food would really agree with me. What was your worst holiday experience? Hmm, I'm shaking just thinking about it. My worst holiday experience ever was undoubtedly when I was six and I got lost in a market area in a rural town in Bavaria. I kept screaming and shouting out my mom's name but I couldn't see her anywhere. Next thing I knew, a policeman had picked me up and I didn't know where he was taking me. Of course, he took me to the station and eventually everything worked out in the end and my parents came and picked me up. But that was the most scared I've ever been in my life. What are the benefits of holidaying in a foreign country? First of all, it's a complete change of scene, which people need sometimes to help them unwind and relax. Secondly, it's a chance to experience another culture and way of life. This is good in the sense that it broadens your horizons, and maybe you'll pick up some good tips you can take back home with you. Thirdly, you get to meet the locals. I think it's important to meet all sorts of different people in life. It promotes tolerance and peace. If we meet people who look different or speak or behave differently to the way we do, then we will not be afraid of them or distrust them. Fourthly, you get to see things you might never otherwise be able to appreciate, like for example, unique landscapes and areas of beauty, or different styles of architecture. Then there is also the fact that you'll get the chance to try out the local cuisine, and that might influence the way you cook and improve your cooking. For language learners, going to a country 
where they get to practice the language is probably the best way to learn. So that's another major plus point of holidaying abroad. I think the point I'm trying to get across is that really the list is endless. There's so much to get out of a foreign holiday. What sorts of problems can people experience when they are abroad? Well, I think the most obvious and common one is the language barrier. Communication can be really hard if you don't speak the same language. Not to mention the fact that there can also be embarrassing misunderstandings when things get lost in translation. Another issue that often crops up is culture shock. For example, in some countries, they are not used to queuing and tourists can get very angry and upset at being passed out in the line. If you have a sensitive palate, you may not find the local cuisine agreeable either which can make life very difficult by limiting your options for places to eat. Weather can also be an issue. It may be that tourists have to adapt to a hotter or colder climate than they are used to. Another major concern is often driving. If you're used to driving on the left, you may have to drive on the right side of the road during your holiday, or vice versa. This can be very trying. Crime can ruin a foreign holiday, as can the loss of your bags or wallet. Another big spoiler is the tendency some locals have to try to take advantage of tourists and overcharge them. The list of potential problems is very, very long. Do you think foreign holidays are affordable to everyone these days? Not exactly. They are definitely more affordable than ever. I mean, flights within Europe have gone very cheap over the last 10 years. And now with the internet cutting out the middleman, you can book entire packages of flights, hotels, and activities for bargain basement prices. That said though, it is still expensive to go abroad for those on lower than average salaries, which is a shame because foreign travel can be such an enlightening experience. Besides, long haul flights remain pricey. I mean, it certainly isn't cheap to fly to America or Australia yet. All in all, I'd say that it's definitely getting cheaper by the year to holiday abroad, but I think there's a long way to go yet before we can all afford to. Is flying a safe way to travel? Nowadays, yes, I would have to say that it is. After all, great strides have been made in aviation and air travel is safer than ever before. The evidence of this is in the fact that there are fewer and fewer cases of accidents. Of course, even though the risk is small, if it goes wrong, then you're still in big trouble. But I would definitely consider flying to be a very safe form of travel today. You are far more likely to be run over by a car as a pedestrian or cyclist or involved in a car crash as a driver than to have an accident on a plane. That's how far aircraft safety has come. Why do some people come back from holidays more stressed than when they left? Well, I think it's easy to understand why that happens. Holidays can be stressful. Dealing with a different culture or language, etc. is never easy. Then there's also the matter of having to spend a lot more time than usual with your family or friends. This can lead to arguments and it's often hard for everyone to stay calm. Another common problem is that people try to do and see too many things. Try to pack too much into one week away in a country. They end up coming home more tired and worn out than when they left. What safety issues do you have to think about when you go away on holiday? Well, first of all, you need to consider how safe the place you are going on holiday to is. Some destinations are safer than others. I mean, in some countries there are dictatorships and the leaders are a law unto themselves. Other places have very strict laws to do with culture or religion and you can get in big trouble for breaking them, even by accident. Besides, if you go to very religious countries, they may not be very tolerant towards foreigners. They may even be anti them. It may be a good idea to know the local police and emergency numbers in advance, in case anything goes wrong. 
and also to have the contact details for your local consulate to hand in the event of something really awful happening that you need help with. Another thing is the fact that tourists often get targeted by criminals, no matter where you go. So you have to be really careful with valuables like cameras and phones, not to mention your wallet, credit cards, cash, and so on. And try not to stand out too much. Try not to look like a tourist. You've got to check out your accommodation in advance, too, to make sure the area is a good one and that the owners are legit. Weather factors can also affect safety. It's important to find out if the place you are going to is prone to violent storms, earthquakes, and so on. And then there are health issues. Do you need vaccinations? Are certain deadly diseases a problem there, and so on?